Welcome back to Yellow Card Vanguard. It is Toku and Zistro back here once again for our third episode of Matchup Dissected. I think we're going to end up keeping this title. I am a big fan of the noun verb, but in our third episode, we've got a bit of a different one. So in our first episode, we had a look at the upper echelon of the V Premium format being Steam Maidens versus its meta counter in Glendios. Our second episode had a look at what we call like just under, just under the tier zero in Jewel Knights and Tavis. And now we're going to be taking a look at some decks that are kind of underrepresented. One of them being Luard, which just got Karon off of the restriction list, as well as Revengers, which similarly to Jewel Knights, got a good set of support for three sets in a row. Let's see if those three sets of support was able to bring Revengers into contention. Yeah, this will wrap up our V Premium series, or beginning of the series. So hopefully sometime after Worlds, we'll be able to start moving on to the other formats, like say Premium or Standard, doing a little bit of exploration there. But for now, this is going to be the Shadow Paladin matchup. Not quite mirror match, but figuring out you know which of these two Shadow Paladin decks is the better deck. So off the get-go here, the main thing to note is that with the unrestriction of Karon off the limited list, Luard now has the option for something that we call the Leofall Rush, where basically opening two Leofalls lets you really grind your opponent to a pulp on turn two if your opponent does give you that counter blast. See here that Ben was able to search a Leofall off of the knees, so I'm already in a position where I know that Ben has a Leofall. If he has a second one, uh, then I am in a position to give him the resources for a Leofall Rush, and that's something I definitely don't want to do, so I do just end up passing here. Yeah, not having Caron back in you know, the last year or so meant that you could afford to deal a little bit of early damage to Luard so that they couldn't get as much advantage off the Leofell. But now with Caron up again, one Leofell can turn into four units on the board, and that is a really high level of threat here. He's even guarding aggressively to try and stop me from capitalizing on it. I have another Leofell in hand at this point, so the moment he gives me damage, it's then off to the races, Leofell for Caron, Luar to find more grade ones, and go from there. And that's kind of where I think Luar pulls ahead as the overall deck in this matchup, because it has both the ability to grind out the long game and take things slow, or really put on the gas and turbo aggro, which Revengers is much less capable of doing because all of Revengers aggro is tied to their grade 3. Mm -hmm. uh, being tied to our grade 3, being tied to having the grade 3 in hand, whereas Luard is able kind of to like just get its all of its pieces together just from being able to ride into Drag Driver. As you get longer and longer into the game, it just scales up more and more via the power, via the amount of cards you can search and also having access to board removal through the ward skill. Not to mention that for some reason, the ability to ride into Drag Driver, I believe, is an act skill. So it's not even like on entry of battle phase that you do it. So even afterwards, you do have options that you can think of doing before you enter battle phase after thinning your deck by five in the later stages of the game. Yeah, so you see here, you know, again, another big thing about Charon is that beyond Owl, it gives you a second reliable source of Soul Blast. So I was able to Soul Blast the grade one that I rode to get myself to the three grade threes and drop zone I need to free stride with the drag card effect. Whereas previously, the only real source of Soul Blast you had was Abyssal Owl, which only worked if you and your opponent's Vanguard were the same grade. Mm -hmm. And yeah, losing that Soul Blast after losing Charon for that the past year was probably more of a hit than we had initially thought, just because Losing that Soul Blast meant that we don't have another Grade 1 to get into drop to have the easier access into the Ritual 3 that was so important for our, our first Grade 3 turn at Luar. Yeah, like for example, even in this turn where I went first, that Leofell would have been dead in my hand, completely useless. It wouldn't have been able to search a Karen. I wouldn't have been able to search at all because I need to save the Counter Blast for the Drag Drivers on place. And I would have actually struggled to put a third grade 3 in the drop zone unless I called one from hand and called over it with some effect. Aaron there just served being double duty in being able to extend a little bit further so I was able to fill my board, thin my deck out, and actually get me to all the pieces I need. Like, every single moving part in this deck is valuable in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. And a big mention to the heal trigger that you got there on your drive check. So, I was unfortunately forced to give you that initial damage because I'm okay to give you the starting damage to get you into grade 3 because I'll eventually have to hit you regardless. So giving you one damage there so you have to kind of like finagle your way between Karon, between Leofels, and between the Drag Driver's Counter Blast. So I did ex make you expend a bit more than you probably had wanted to than if I had given you the two Counter Blasts had I swung at your grade two. But you getting that heal trigger there now opens me up to the venue that I can actually double Raging Fall into your rear guards. 
Now, obviously, you do have the Decroms there, so the first wing is going to go into the bat, so you can't intercept to cut me off from attacking the second one. But the fact that you got that heal trigger there now makes your next turn incredibly vanilla. And it really does, like, soften the damage that I'm going to take on the next turn, since you're going to be not doing too much. Yeah, it definitely gives you a lot of time to farm up the Force Markers and build towards your, your end game triple Raging Fall combo with crits. The one thing I will mention is that this strategy ha does have some risks associated with it in the form that even without damage, because I have three grade ones in my drop zone, I can still go into a drag driver every turn. And so I will at some point get more force markers than you. And the longer the game goes, i.e. the more time that I'm not taking damage, the more force markers I'll get. And when I have more force markers than you, that will eventually win me the game. Whereas with, in your case, Revengers has no way of recycling their grade threes. So once you burn all four copies of Raging Form, and you burn one or two copies of Raging Fall, there's there's nothing left, there's no more gas. So mm -hmm. uh, at some point, you cap out on eight Force Markers, but I don't have a cap, and that is what I think will let me really get ahead here. Yeah, so I think the main strategy here is that by damage denying you on this turn, in order for you to be able to put out a strong offense, I'm forcing you to call your Grade Ones out from hand instead of being able to Superior call them off of Drag Drivers on Ride Skill. Uh, unfortunately for me, I believe that you run more than the two copies of Abyssal Owl that most people do, and that lets you have like a good venue of being able to cycle while putting down strong attackers with that base 2 crit now that you've gone into your second Drag Driver. So, despite my uh, valiant efforts to try and force your hand and make it just a bit weaker by forcing 10k guards out, it's not even that bad for you as well because of the 10k guards being able to use as interceptors because of the cramps. So. It's kind of a losing battle for me the moment I saw that Leah fell. I think if I didn't see a Leah fell, I would be happy to attack because Luard is a deck, like you said, that although it does build force markers a lot and a lot, it does need time to ramp for those force markers to really matter. Yeah, like one thing to know about this turn here is that I could have put the... When I first rode the driver, I put the second force marker on the left column to have 2-2 two, two on each column. And my original plan was to push forward the carrot to swing for 28 and then have a 25k owl on the other side. But then I realized that the longer the game goes on, the more I have to kill from hand to put up a board, more time you'll get to you know, build up shield and try and survive my multi-crit attacks. So in this case, by building just one column, if you're going to try and do the multi re-ride multi-vanguard swing this turn, you will eventually have to give me damage, which I'm totally okay with. And if not, it means that you're not farming as many cards, you're not farming as many force markers, you're not getting as far ahead, which means that when you actually give me damage, that drive will become a lot more threatening. Mm -hmm. I think one of the interesting things that happened this turn as well is that for a spoiler, not spoiler, that was the only copy of Raging Form I had in my hand at this point. And I was actually not expecting Ben to do what he would do. Uh, and that actually also slows me down a turn as well, but I also end up doing some interesting plays here because I thought that I could get the on hit off. But as you see, I'm trying to get down a lot of Rinnels to, because Ben's now at zero damage, I think he's more inclined to take the damage, so to speak. So while he's more inclined to take the damage, I want to try and get advantage out of that by getting the Rinnels. So I start my attack phase by swinging into the Owl just to get it off the board because it's still a 10k intercept. That would then make it harder for our future attacks for, for my future attacks to hit. So now that that's off the board, I then swing into Vanguard with the on-hit pressure of Rinnell. But like I said before, I had initially rolled that copy of Raging Fall from hand just to get the limit breakdown. But here, Ben actually guards. And so I was not expecting this. And because Ben guards and I don't get the triggers needed to hit, I actually didn't have a second copy of Raging Form to go back into. So my choice here was that... I was actually going to just stop the attacks there and leave Ben once again at zero damage, once again forced to call down cards from hand to try and attack with Myth, uh, instead of getting the Counter Blast 1 plus 4 if I was to attack with that last column. Yeah, the difference here is that by stopping there, even though I gave up a lot of cards in hand, the play was massively tempo favored for me because the thing about Shadow Paladin is that all forms of Shadow Paladin are all about soft plussing and converting those soft pluses to board into hard pluses to hand. My conversion of soft to hard is Owl, which is guaranteed. Your conversion is Renal, which is not guaranteed. Like even if you had chosen to attack with the uh, Tartu Renal column there at the end, I could have easily chosen to guard that, stayed on zero damage, and just continued farming force markers. And at some point, like I mentioned, you know, 
by being able to continuously grind it out and you like get those pluses no matter what, the game becomes a slowly in my favor. Yeah. So here, you know, by you choosing to give up the attack, I still have a massive damage loo, which sure, it does turn off my heals, but it means that all those cards that you're building up in hand more than I am, you're going to be incentivized to use up more of those than, uh, than I am because you have more attacks you need to guard compared to me. Mm -hmm. And even if it's not more attacks, like these are more effective attacks because of the base two crit from Drag Driver, even, even like your weakest grade one in hand, on that quad force marker is still asking for a lot of cards from hand. So I do get a very good heal here. I actually didn't want that heal because I did want to go to Limit Break 5 just to that way I am able to turn on like the full Wombo Combo Raging Form Form Fall. But on that last swing, I do have to card with two triggers from hand. So that's just to say that one grade one card from Ben's hand was able to rip out 30k shield from my hand. And that's basically just a testament as to how strong the ward gets as it's given more time. So similar to what we said for steam maidens where you do zero or three i'm thinking that you might have to apply the same thought process to the ward as well uh, because like i said because they need time to scale up uh, to be able to get all the shield in hand from all the owls and such if you hit them to three early they might not have the resources to use all that counter blast effectively and with that you can actually hit them to six sooner than they expect yeah and here i'm just again guarding really aggressively using a bunch of cards in my hand just so i can set up returning what i need and being able to call down what I have, because I have a Morphester in hand already to go, there's a bat in my soul, there's a bat in my drop, and I want to be able to get that 20k back into the deck so I can find it again with Drag Drivers on place. And the thing about like stacking Force Marks here, you know, when you were mentioning about how this 10k shield in my hand ripped out 30k shield from you, the difference here is that those 10k, like that rearguard attack is something that you have to guard because you're on 4, whereas again here, your Raging form is like, 43k minimum, maybe 53k after triggers. Raging Fall, likewise, will be like 53, maybe 63k. Those are attacks that I can just afford to no guard, because even if you double crit on the Raging Form, I like that's only three damage, it's not lethal. Mm -hmm. And I'm I've seen enough crits from you as well that I'm pretty confident that if you crit me on the Raging Form and then go into Raging Fall, you're still probably not gonna kill me. Mm -hmm. So there was actually two methods of thought here as well. I think we even discussed about it in game that after this, because I couldn't win even if I rode, uh, maybe that there was value on me in getting another two drive checks to try and cycle out the raging fall that I had in hand for like a better two drive checks. Or I could like leave all those three cards on the board and get the cycle through the door range in the back for a better card there and keep the two 5Ks as interceptors. But I think ultimately it was better for me to actually just get the drive checks out, uh, force more cards out of Ben's hand, even if I did get the double crit here, maybe I would not have won, but it would have like made it easier for me to win on the next turn after. Yeah, and the important thing as well is that because you're on three, that heal meant that you can now afford to reliably take when my rear guard swings. So the overall lethality of my turn has dropped a little bit, and that gives you more room to hit defensives. Mm -hmm. Again, hitting defensives doesn't make a difference when all of the rear guards are like 50k plus, but you know, by farming those extra cards in hand, you got that 15k shield, which might have been exactly what you needed to stay alive. Mm -hmm. But yeah, at this point, I think like we're already at like peak uh, force marker farming for the ward. So almost an inevitability that this game is going to go into Ben's favor. But as stated before, the fact that I was able to get that heal on one of those drive checks going down to three rather than staying at four means I do have a chance of no guarding one of the rear guard attacks and getting some defensive that could basically just nullify a force marker on a stack. The only other downside here is that I don't have the ability to make that huge column because I'm not playing Branwen. So these numbers aren't the most ready thing in the world, but they're still you know, something for you to be worried about. Yeah, this point of the game, uh, I believe Ben already has the bat combo set up. So I'm looking at four rearguard attacks with the crit as well as a really strong Vanguard attack. So my line of play here is to take one of the rearguard attacks, PG the Vanguard, and then basically hard guard the rest. And I do believe that this ends up ripping out all the other cards in my hand. And I'm forced to then pretty much use my remaining cards as pseudo triggers. And we'll kind of see that come into narrative come my turn. But Ben starts to swing with a Charon base to crit. And I think I decide to immediately take it here and pray for some triggers. I do get a heal that does go off, which means I'm now able to also no guard the Vanguard swing. It just means that you are praying for the crit, which is a little bit risky. Mm -hmm. And like seeing that heal then is what makes me decide to go with the Morphessa first instead of Vanguard first. 
so that the, but when the bats come out, they become the lethal swings, which you still need to guard, because you're risking no guarding the Vanguard swing already. Yeah. The other thing to mention here is that you know, this is kind of what you're saying about how Luar being able to grind up the game has really taken its toll, because by you going through some of your pieces, like some of your raging forms already, and taking some damage to enable that, more of my attacks are able to be focused, going to face, whereas you were spending more of your time focused on trying to stop me from being able to pop off sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. So the no guard from the Vanguard swing, I don't get right here. So two more bat swings that I have to deal with. Uh, and and th this column is huge. I think I was able to survive because of the defensive heal trigger. Beca because Ben was able to heal down to three as well. And with the cards that Ben was able to amass throughout the game by calling out the owls and by not having to guard so heavily uh, in the early game because I didn't have to attack. This basically let Ben build up a hand disparity that I wasn't able to basically take care of on the prior turns. Yeah, like not needing to guard as aggressively on your first few grade three turns means that I can just save all the PGs that I've been accumulating over the game and burn them all. Now that now that your numbers are actually threatening, I've been able to save and hold on to those PGs for these swings now. So no matter even if you were able to like full full combo me this turn it still wouldn't be anywhere near threatening because I have at least two PGs in hand and enough shield to guard everything else. Mm -hmm. Now, we did lose the Decromps on your side of things, so you did end up losing 20k worth of shield on the Interceptors here. And my on my side of things, instead of choosing to actually do like triple lock, I chose to re-ride into a Raging Fall to quote-unquote effectively get a trigger's worth of power. And through Tartu skill, I was able to get a Reno onto the board, thin my deck by one, but instead of having the third card being used for a lock as well, because because I do need three cards to discard, uh, I kept it in hand and locked two to gain another trigger's worth of power. So basically, I am asking Ben that he does need to have PGs or rip out the rest of his hand in order to be guard these. So that this was my one out. Unfortunately, I only had the one crit left in deck, which was at the bottom of the deck. So. No matter how many attacks I was able to do, with the PGs that Ben was able to amass, with the cards in hand that Ben was able to amass, there was no way for me to try and break through his defensives. Yeah, and again, like in situations like this, where let, you know, let's say that I had guarded more aggressively, I was staying on low damage, you were still playing towards this run me out of resources game. Because it cost me nothing to re-ride and to drive every turn and to recycle drag hearts, I'm always winning that grind game because mm -hmm. Revenger has no recycling, you won't be able to put anything back into the deck. So my deck size will always be bigger than yours, despite the fact that I'm actually going through more cards per turn than you are. So yeah, would you agree that the proper way to play against Ward right now would then be similarly to Steam Maiden, you do want to deny that initial Leo fall, one counter blast, but you might also want to do like the zero or three paradigm that we keep talking about, because Luar does need time to scale up to a breakneck point, but between that initial early game and between the point where you get to like these six force markers on each stack, you are still fairly vulnerable if your deck has a way of removing the decrumps in the back that also really stifles their game plan as well. And that might be what is needed to push the ward back down out of its resurgence or attempt at resurging. I think it's a lot more dangerous than Steam Maiden because the existence of the Ill Donna Painter combo means that even if Lord goes first and you damage nigh them, there is still the chance that they can high roll you to oblivion and just win the game on going going first on grade three. Like, there are times when Luard doesn't need five or six force markers to win the game. It just needs to go ride Dragheart, push an Ildonner in, and just swing at you three times with crit. That mm -hmm. is enough a lot of the times. So up until Ildonner's release, I would have said that rushing Luard is the best way, because as you mentioned, it needs time to build its force markers, and the faster you can push it to three or four, means that they won't have as much time to build those force markers. But now, with the existence of that high roll combo, uh, rushing is now very dangerous as well, because Leofels can turn into Plussing, which turns into Ildonas, which turns into Painters, which turns into whatever else you might need. And that's the risk you're playing at, so it's not as easy as like, oh, either 3 or 0, because sometimes 3 will be correct, and sometimes 0 will be correct. Mm. And knowing which one is which is... So here's the situation where I did have the turn 1 Ildonna, but if I don't reveal Ildonna on turn 1, and I just say discard it on turn 3 or turn 4 for a PG or, what, or call over it, mm -hmm. you have no idea it's coming. So I have no idea it's coming. That. So in this situation, it's telegraphed. In this situation, you can see, like, if I have the Painter on turn 3, you know, your, your life is, like, 
goes downhill significantly. Yeah, actually but, shambles. But the, at the same time, Luad is the sort of deck that has enough flexibility that it can go surprise Ildana out of nowhere. Yeah. And that is what's threatening for you. Yeah. Like you said about being telegraphed, I showed you that my hand was weak because of my geoassist in this time around. But you also showed me that you had Leofall. You also showed me that you had double Ildana here. So once again, the ball is definitely in my court to not swing. But I do believe that because of my hand's weakness and because I did have a Rinnell, I did choose to swing on this turn here. Because I had to G-Assist, because my hand was now inherently more weaker, because I did have the proper, this time around, the Grade 1 and Grade 2 ride, that is able to get me the plus 2 on riding into the Grade 3, I did choose to swing here because I thought that I would be safe considering that I'd be going into my Grade 3 first, in which case I'd be able to try and put you through the ringer. Yeah, like you've only seen one Leofell, which was added off of the knees. So here, you have to be aware that there's the possibility of Leofell into Charon, into Leofell, into another Karen, And then unless I heal, you become unable to deny my drag drivers. And then again, that pushes you up to a really high amount of damage, to my low amount of damage. We go back to the game one dichotomy of it's like, you have to guard more attacks than I do. Therefore, your advantage in hand is going down compared to me. But so what you did here, instead of going for the second car on to kind of cut me off of the damage denial that you had just said, you went for the painter to actually charge the Ildona early as if to signal that you were looking to kill me on the next turn right after. I was able to get two defensive draw triggers, which actually does really help me out in the long turn of things. And you do choose to hit me to limit break four, which I'm actually very happy about because this then makes my first grade 3 ride into Raging Fall, basically a plus 3. And off of this plus 3 that I do get off of Raging Fall, I am sort of able to put you through the ringer, because you've expended a card from hand in the Leah Fall, as well as cut yourself off of some lines by going into the Painter instead of a second Caron. So let's kind of see what I decide to do here. Sorry, I go over the double Raging Form turn, but I didn't have the Limit Break nor the Locks for the Raging Fall. I end my turn on the Raging Fall, but the Crackback after, because you already have the Ildana in soul, you were able to hit me into crits. And I do think that it makes my upcoming turn harder to guard. But with the forces that I was able to farm on this turn, by the time it comes back to my turn after yours, my force scaling has outsped yours. And I should be able to look to end the game then. Yeah, the important thing to note here is that in this game, I am the one in control of the tempo. And while you are able to you know, keep up in, in, a, in a simple phrase, I'm still the one like being in the driving force. You know, I'm still the one saying like, I'm putting you on damage and then you, I'm telling you to give me the damage. Like you know, here, you're not choosing to swing at my rear guards because you can. It's you have to swing at my face because this is how you get back into the game. Mm -hmm. And I think being able to control that momentum is part of what makes Luar such a strong deck. Mm -hmm. So like you said, I am forced, like I had the option to swing at rears, to do like the double swing at rear, but I'm already at four and you had already shown me that even without the counter blast, you are still able to go into drag driver and get base to crit onto your rear guards. And if I'm not going to actually like cycle drive checks to try and heal down to at least three, all of your rear guard attacks are already lethal and I'm still looking at a very big grade three vanguard as well comes down to when Revenger is trying to put forward an aggro, it has a higher ceiling as far as its you know, combo and win potential goes, but the way it gets there and what it does if it doesn't get there pales, I think pales a lot in comparison to what Luard can do. Like you can see here, my aggro isn't as strong as your aggro. Like if I hadn't taken all this damage and I hadn't set up the, the Ildonas in Soul, my turn three was not going to be anywhere near as scary or threatening but I still would have been able to do something that not quite matches what you're doing here, but gets me close, but it also at the same time gets me in a position where you eventually stop being threatening while I'm always threatening. Yeah, and I think that's the main thing to note is I, I get to a point where I stop being threatening is a really good way to put it, because this is probably my most effective turn chance that I have is when I go first and I am able to get to grade three first. Not being locked to my opponent being a grade 3, not being locked to having a grade 3, and so uh, Raging Form is able to really start accelerating my game state, being able to get on hits off the Rinnels that I am able to search off. Also getting that heal, like I said, 
it basically, if I didn't go for the triple re-ride by attacking into your rearguards, I probably would not have gotten that heal uh, because of the way that I was able to thin my deck, search off a Reynolds. But basically, this ends me on Raging Fall. I don't have the fourth attack for the turn. But by this time, you were only able to get two defensives. And even with two defensives, I think Raging Fall was swinging over already. So I was able to force even more cards out of your hand. And with all the Reynolds that I'm able to retire this turn through the rewrites, I can also pick at your board that you were able to plus off of last turn as well. It puts me in a lot harder position because when I eventually go into the driver, I won't have as many pieces I need. And the trigger here really pushed you over the top. Like I could have gotten it a little bit more aggressively, but knowing that you were retiring my board with Reynolds, I was sort of tempted to like hold on to a few more pieces just so I can try and push the game next turn, which unfortunately mm. I wasn't able to. So I think we're going to fast forward into middle of another game here we've already skipped a few turns and we're both at grade three and similarly to the other previous games as well i've been damage denying you because i don't want you to have that leofall that very strong leofall turn two but already here you're already sitting very nice at six force markers and in this game i did not get good rides i did not get the rukea rakea ride i rode into dorant and clodas and they don't do anything on the ride they didn't do anything on the ride they don't have the on hits so I was playing very vanilla, but I think I wanted to use it as a showcase that even while on Raging Fall, a vanilla Raging Fall, you still can get some things out here. So initially, despite myself putting all of the Force Markers onto the Vanguard column, by making that double Reno column and attacking the Raging Fall into the Painter, I'm now forcing Ben to take the Reno swings here. Put the crit into the second Reno, the back row Reno to not give Ben that double damage. Thinking back, I probably should have put the crit on the front row because I do need to eventually push for game on the next turn. But by using Raging Fall's skill here to effectively give both of my Reynolds 15k worth of power, I was able to pseudo triple force marker that column, which helps build my hand back despite not having a way of being able to plus. And on the next turn now that I've got some Raging Forms back in my hand, I'm able to start kind of um, setting up my next turn play as well. Yeah, like, you know, what we were saying about earlier about how Revengers doesn't really have that backup plan. Like, Tony is still playing the game. Like, what he's doing here is not awful by any means. It's just that when you look at the other side of the table, and I've ridden Dracart twice, I've got six Force Markers, despite having been damage denied. All that damage and I has done is stopped him from taking loads of damage from enabling me to full combo. And I still have the Karens, so even one, even one Counter Blast here, I can Leofell for both Karens and still go into the driver and still push with more Fessers with all that damage open. I think like it's definitely a narrative that like now that Karen's off the list, the ward, it, and it surprises me that I didn't see the ward represented too much in this current BCS season. And I want to ask you, Ben, because I, th I believe that you've played a lot more of the ward than I have. Why do you think the ward was not represented as well as we had initially expected? But the big problem with Luard is that Luard actually has a very rough Steam Maiden matchup in that if Steam Maiden and Luard rush each other, you're both playing on high damage, but Steam Maiden can do a lot more with its damage than Luard can. Like sure, Luard can go Leofell into Karen, into Leofell, into Owl, into Driver, into whatever, but being that has to wait until turn 3, whereas turn 2, Steam Maiden with 3 damage can just go double Entrana into something else, and then next turn, it's already got everything set up so that it can just go ride Elol, call Colossus, and you know, sh shred through all that hand advantage that you had supposedly built. Mm. While at the same time, putting forward not quite the same amount of lethality, but a different angle. So it does more attacks, less crits, but an equal amount of power a lot of the time. You know, Steam Maiden's regular pattern is like 25 into 28 into 29 into 33 into Vanguard Swing into some other numbers. And Luard, on the first grade 3 with only 3 force markers, you're looking more at like, you know, 20, 28 Vanguard Swing, which is usually 46, into another 23, 28, 33 maximum. Like, these aren't that threatening numbers, even with the crit behind them going early, which combined with the fact that Steam Maiden can plus at the same time and build up the shield on the first turn, grade 3 turn, it needs, means that, you know, those 23, 33k shields aren't nearly as threatening to Steam Maiden as they are to any other deck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it, is that Steam Maiden probably does more with the Counter Blasts, because, like we said before, the best way to deal with both of these decks is probably to rush them. 
uh, depending on what we see, obviously, on the ward side of things. But Steam Maidens probably does so much more effective stuff with their counter blast, considering they have inbuilt within the combo counter charger that even if you were able to deny them, then they still have a way of going back into combo. And as stated before, when we were talking about dead zones in the game, similarly to Steam Maidens, the ward doesn't have a lot of dead zones, but Steam Maidens is able to make use of more zones more effectively than the ward can. And I think it's that kind of like resource talk that probably pushes Steam Maiden over the ward still, even with the removal of Karon from the ban list. Off the top of my head, I think in Belgium, uh, Luard actually ended up winning V Premium, beating out a bunch of Steam Maidens along the way. But I think that speaks a lot more to the quality of the player that uh, Pierre Mahato is, as opposed to the quality of the deck. Like, the people he was playing Steam Maidens against weren't slouches either, but he is a practiced Luard player, and he's probably had been able to test against equally high quality Steam Maidens as well. So that's a matchup that he was familiar with. But on the whole, I'd say that if your Steam Maiden player knows what they're doing and the Luard player knows what they're doing, most of the time Steam Maiden is favoured just because they have just a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more reach, and that is, again, like I said, what pushes it over the edge a lot of the times. And so speaking of pushing over the edge here, despite all of my attempts at trying to limit the damage I was going to take this turn uh, with my damage uh, denial plans, I'm still, I was still looking at a lot of damage. Like, yes, you didn't get the Morphessa double bat attack, and I, I think even if you did, I would have lost because of all the force markers. I wasn't able to get the PGs because I got them from the, because I got them into damage triggers. But I was able to get to five here, and I'm basically trying to kill you on this turn. But we did see that you were able to get that double PG on your drive check. So it's like the writing's on the wall at this point. I've been outscaled in force markers. I've been outscaled in hand. Without that very explosive grade three turn that I looked to get from getting hit to limit break four and getting the plus one off of the raging fall, I'm unable to really kind of get back in the driver's seat as you will. Basically, you're just able to like run away with the game the moment that you were able to get into grade three. I, w I wonder if that like changes up at all if we were talk into Steam Maidens versus Revengers. Because let's say Revengers is able to like have like a really good setup turn. I wonder if Revengers has the tools to be able to kind of punish Steam Maidens for rushing them through Entriana and such. I think the big issue with the Revengers into Steam Maidens is that Steam Maiden hits a lot harder than Luard, and as we've seen throughout these last few games, the amount of damage that you're able to sort of, not mitigate, but prevent, is so much lower than the damage that Luard can prevent. So it's not even about being able to punish them for the rush, it's more about being able to survive the rush at all. Mm. Like, the problem with Revengers and Steam Maiden is that both decks have a very similar sort of peak, right? Yeah. Both decks get to grade 3, and on turn 3, they sort of hit their stride as it were. Like, you know, they both... Their game plan gets going on turn 3 a, a lot more effectively than the Wards does on turn 3, even if Ward high rolls a little bit. And so what you're relying on is that you're relying on, like, the double or the triple Raging Form turn on turn 3 to really push you in a position where your opponent is crippled or you're just, like, a few steps away from winning the game. And against Steam Maiden, that can sometimes happen, but I think what's more likely as a Steam Maiden player is that you'll be in a position where the Steam Maiden has pushed the Revenger player into a position where they're nearly lost losing the game, and Steam Maiden still has all the pieces they need to fight back as well. Mm. Because as you mentioned, something that Steam Maiden is better at than Luard and Shadow Paladin is having access to its pieces. Like, Revenger needs certain pieces here and there, like say, you know, as you mentioned, the Rikea, Rakea ride line, you want Rinaus to turn soft pluses into hard pluses, but Luard needs its Karens, it needs its Leofails, it needs to actually ride Luards, it needs to find Ildon if it wants the high roll to really get there. And Steam Maiden only needs to find Entrana, and that's basically it. Everything yeah. else comes naturally. And so, by that logic, it's a lot harder to guarantee that Steam Maiden will get there than it is Revenge or Luard getting there. Okay, yeah, I think that's a really good point, but is that there's a lot less pieces to rely on in the Steam Maiden side of things because their one piece that they rely on ends up becoming every other piece in the game for them. So I think basically Steam Maidens will still be the upper echelon of the format as it looks to be, but I really do enjoy what Revengers can do. And I think basically it's great three turn if you are able to like get the perfect ride to be able to like have the f all the fuel needed for that initial raging form. It can get very out of hand very quickly because of being able to outscale your opponent's first turn at grade three 
with your first turn in grade three. Yeah, the one thing I will definitely mention though is what something that's worth keeping in mind is that if you go back throughout this entire video and you take a look at like how we've been guarding our attacks, I don't think Tony or I have ever hard no pass without the PG. Like most of our guards have been like one to passes or two to passes, and that's something that Shadow Paladin struggles with compared to Steam Maiden. Like the number of times a Steam Maiden player can say no pass without using the PG is a lot higher than Shadow Paladin. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of my like a lot of my two to passes you saw in one of those games, I gave him the one pass or the two to pass for, for lethal and he broke it because I just was being greedy and keeping pieces in hand. Whereas maidens can just say over guard, no pass, and then turn those pieces that they've guarded with into life pieces anyway. Yeah. But yeah, so that will basically conclude our third game of the V Premium matchup dissected. It was a very interesting narrative to see how such a familiar face in Luard has kind of fallen off. And I think it's literally like you said, it just has a bad run into Steam Maidens, which is the current boogeyman of the format. But despite being said that, like Luard, it, it feels like a gatekeeper almost because like it says like if you can't beat Luard, there's definitely no way you can beat Steam Maidens. What do you think about that statement? I think that's absolutely true. Like the fact that, like I said, Steam Maiden is favored into Luard, but I think Luard is probably Steam Maiden's second hardest matchup after any sort of control deck like Link Joker or Kagura or Narukami. Like the fact that Luard does almost what Steam Maiden does, almost as good, is what really pushes it up there. And I think I'm confident in saying that should we see a ban list where Steam Maiden gets taken off of its throne, like say with Entrana ban or Colossus ban or Gearcat ban or whatever. I think without doubt, Luard becomes the next best deck in the game. Yeah, I think I would have to agree as well, but that will about sum it up for here. Uh, thank you one and again, everybody for swinging by to watch our third video of the matchup dissected. Let us know down in the comments below what you guys thought about the gameplay, what your favorite moments were, and what you'd like to see in the future. As stated before, once Worlds is finished up, we're going to be looking to do this kind of stuff for the other formats as well. Standard Premium. Let us know what kind of decks you want us to feature there as well. Yes, Steam Maidens is also a hot topic in Premium as well, but there's a lot more in Premium than just Steam Maidens and Narukami. So let us know what you want to see down below. Once again, this has been Toku and Zistra from Yellow Card Vanguard. Thank you for swinging by to the channel, and we hope you guys have a great day. We will see you next time.